Today, I want to present the Carnot engine. This is a theoretical construct, and it's impossible to build. The reason for presenting it is that Edward Carnot was able to show that it is the most efficient engine possible, thus it represents a standard by which to compare all other engines. On a PV diagram, I'll show four discrete thermodynamic states, and the discussion will be about the processes in going from one state to another, as well as the arithmetic that describes the curves on a PV diagram. From the equations, it is possible to obtain pressure, volume, and temperature for all four states, starting actually with very little information. The Carnot engine is a heat engine. That means that heat is supplied from the surroundings and that heat is dissipated back to the surroundings, and that the energy difference between the two is represented by work done on the surroundings. Our system will be the gas inside the cylinder. Now, in most presentations of the Carnot engine, you'll not see a physical representation as shown here for the simple reason that there's a requirement for completely reversible expansions and compressions, and that makes the physical engine impossible. On the left is a schematic of the engine. It consists of a cylinder with orange insulated sidewalls and an infinite thermal bottom plate. The cylinder is fitted with a piston, which then has a mechanical linkage to a rotational element on a shaft. When the shaft turns, work is done by the system on the surroundings, or vice versa, as will be shown. The goal of any heat engine, this one included, is to put in heat energy and obtain network. In state one, the gas is at temperature one, and in the PV diagram, pressure is as high as it will ever be, and volume is as small as it will ever be. This isothermal curve, one right here, this isothermal curve is a graph of the equation for the path from state one to state two. Heat will be absorbed into the gas molecules, which will become more energetic and cause expansion of the piston in order to exactly maintain their temperature. So delta T will be, e will be equal to zero even though heat has been added. The isothermal graph segment comes directly from the ideal gas law. So the, so the equation of this particular segment of the line comes directly from the ideal gas law. This will be T1, or it could be T2, over V. So P is a function of, pressure is a function of volume, and it's this particular equation to get that segment of the graph. In state two, the temperature remains at T1 by definition of an isothermal path. So what happens next? Miraculously, the cylinder bottom is altered to be perfectly insulated, and the shaft flywheel continues to spin, thus continuing the system expansion. However, in the absence of our infinite heat source, it's become an adiabatic expansion, meaning that no heat is put into the gas, therefore causing temperature to drop. The equation for this segment of the cycle is P times V to the gamma, where gamma, if you'll recall, is Cp over Cv. So it's P times V to the gamma is equal to a constant. Well, if it's equal to constant, then any particular pressure and any particular volume is also equal to that constant. And that means that P as a function of V, let's see here, P as a function of V is going to be equal to P sub I, V sub I. We'll pick one, thereby getting our constant. And then that will simply be over V to the gamma. So there is pressure as a function of volume. That's the graph of that little section of the curve. That's going to go to a new temperature, T3. Temperature won't remain constant. Temperature will drop. Once in state three, 
our engine experiences yet another miracle of mechanical engineering, and the perfectly insulated bottom plate changes to an infinite heat-absorbing ocean that just exactly matches the temperature of state 3. As heat is absorbed, the piston is contracted and temperature, again isothermal, does not change as heat is removed. The isothermal equation for this segment of the curve is identical to the segment from state 1 to state 2, except that we have T, we have T is equal to T3 or T4. Once again, they're the same, it's isothermal. So the equation for this section, P, P is going to be a function of volume, is equal to N. R, we'll call it T3, over V. Now that is this piece right there. The process from T, from state 3 to state 4. As we go from state 4 back to state 1, the flywheel continues compression of the gas, but now with a completely insulated cylinder, thus causing temperature to rise. In the adiabatic gas compression, no heat transfers, therefore temperature must go up. Our path is going to take us back to state one to complete the cycle. The curved segment equation will be like that of the segment from state two to state three, except that the constant PV to the gamma will be different. So we can write the equation here. It's going to be P as a function of V, is equal to, and we're, I'm going to write P4V4, P4V4 to the gamma over, it's going to be over V to the gamma. And that, of course, this part up here is the constant, and so that could have been P1V1, they're on the same curve, therefore they're the same constant over V to the gamma. And that is this little section of the curve right here. Now I have returned to process one, the path from state one to state two, and we want to ask about the work that's done. Since work is the negative integral of PDV, and we're using the ideal gas law, we know that pressure is going to be equal to NR T1, since that's where we're at, T1, over V. Therefore, work will be equal to the negative integral from V1 to V2 of NR T, T1, over V, and that that will be equal to minus N R T1, T1, times the log of V2 over V1. Now since V2 is greater than V1, the gas will be expanding and the log of V2 over V1 will be a positive number. So the gas does work on the environment and the work calculates to a negative number. In the second process, state two to state three, because of the ideal gas, work is even easier to calculate. Q is zero and by the first law, internal energy is equal to work. Let me write that. U is equal to Q plus W, but Q is equal to zero, so U is equal to W. Also, for an ideal gas, U depends only on temperature. That is, delta U is equal to CV delta T which obviously would be equal to delta W. So work, and we know for an ideal gas that CV is 3 halves R, 
three halves r. So work is going to be CV delta T. That's going to be T3 minus T2. Now that's for an ideal monotonic gas because that's the CV for a monotonic, monotonic gas. Now for state 3 to state 4, we're back to an isothermal step and work is again minus nRT times the log of V final over V initial, minus nRT times the log of V final over V initial. Here, V final would be V4, V4, and V initial would be V3. So our work would be equal to minus N R. We can choose T3. We could also choose T4 since they're clearly the same. But N R times the log. NRT times the log of V4 over V3. Now, since V4 is less than V3, V4 is less than V3, we have a compression. That means that the log is going to be negative, and the work, because a negative of a negative is positive, the work is going to be positive. In the last cycle process, we again have an adiabatic step, and work will be equal to CV delta T. So here, work is going to be 3 halves R. Remember, it's a monatomic gas. That's CV. And it's going to be times T1 minus T4. Uh, since T1 is greater than T4, work for this step will be positive, and it will always exactly cancel the negative work of process 2. Finally, the network for the engine is just the sum of the work calculated around the cycle. It's that simple. All right, well, that's enough for this video. I'll have another video soon that shows how to use these equations to obtain the pressure, volume, and temperature of any and all unknown states. Thank you, and I hope you keep watching.